Spider-Man, how did it come about? Well, I had already done the Fantastic Four and the Hulk, and I got to Spider-Man. It sounded mysterious and dramatic, and lo, a legend was born. Was it a hit right away? Yes. And t I'll tell you something funny about that. Nobody wanted me to do it. My publisher, when I suggested the idea, he said, that's the worst thing I ever heard of. Why? People hate spiders. You can't call a hero Spider-Man. So he wouldn't let me do it. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and when you think about it, Stan's critics kind of had a point. Spiders are a strange motif to base a superhero around. They're often depicted as creatures of fear and disgust. But I would imagine that most of us don't associate Spider-Man with horror. In fact, some of us would say that he is a friendly neighborhood superhero. But what if we've been thinking about Spidey all wrong. What if the webhead was secretly designed since his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy 15 to be Marvel's perfect horror monster? A comic book terror hidden under our noses this entire time, disguising a, a radioactive spider-human hybrid as a superhero in bright red spandex so Marvel could sneakily get around comic book censorship guidelines that were killing off horror comics in droves. Face front, true believers. This frightful origin of Spider-Man is a web of intrigue in and of itself. Now, I hear ya, Spider-Man as a horror monster might sound like a play out of left field, but it's not unprecedented for Marvel to take inspiration from the horror genre to create their iconic superheroes. Probably the best example is the Hulk, who Stanley has often said was a mixture of Jekyll and Hyde fused with Frankenstein's monster. In fact, in early Hulk stories, Bruce Banner would transform into the Green Behemoth not due to his anger issues, but rather due to the light of a full moon, a classic horror trope reminiscent of werewolves. I used to own this town. Sorry. Of course, the revival of Marvel as we know them today started earlier than the Hulk with the launch, literally and figuratively, of the Fantastic Four, a team of superheroes that didn't look like any other costume crime fighters on store shelves at the time. If you inspect the covers of the first few issues of Fantastic Four, they don't really look like superhero comics. Notice how they don't wear costumes and how the focus of the covers were the vicious monsters. The composition was reflective of large creature stories that were rampant throughout comics at that time. And you might not find them scary now, sure, but horror was undoubtedly the intention back in those days, with these titanic terrors. The problem was, these giant creatures were just about as frightening as comics could get during this time, thanks to the Comics Code. Yes, the Comics Code Authority, or CCA, is something we've talked about a lot on this channel and will be undoubtedly something I'll talk about until the day I return to dust because it's, it's, it's one of those significant things that happen in the comic book industry that we just, we can't get around. In short, crime and horror comic books were pretty much dominating sales during the late 40s and early 50s. Rising public fear that these lurid comics were corrupting the minds and morals of children led to publishers imposing stricter regulations and guidelines for what comics were allowed to print. These new rules slashed artists and writers' abilities to deliver the gruesome imagery readers wanted. You couldn't even use the word horror or terror in titles anymore. And we have an entire video about the CCA up here if you want to learn more. It's a wild time. Anyway, as author Mike Benton explains in the Illustrated History of Horror Comics, I have that book actually, I might as well just hold it. Anyway, as author Mike Benton explains in the Illustrated History of Horror Comics, these giant creature and fantasy stories found in comics like Tales of Suspense, Journey into Mystery, and Tales to Astonish used big monsters to give their audience a feel of horror since creatures like vampires, werewolves, and zombies were off limits, thanks to the comics code. Same goes for the book featuring Spider-Man's debut, Amazing Fantasy, which was called Amazing Adult Fantasy for its first 14 issues. Without fail, every other installment of the series capitalized on some kind of monstrous threat. And then there was Spider-Man in issue number 15. That's interesting. As you saw at the top of this video, Marvel's then publisher, Martin Goodman, was against the idea of Spider-Man for many reasons, but eventually agreed to let Stan introduce the prospective hero in the 15th and final issue of Amazing Fantasy. Because the anthology was on its last issue, it made the perfect testing grounds for the webhead. If the character flopped, wouldn't really matter because the book was gonna end anyway. We had a book we were gonna drop, and when you do the last issue of a book, nobody cares what you put into it, so I featured Spider-Man on the cover. To illustrate the comic, Lee famously approached legendary artist Jack Kirby, as he did for most comics, but wasn't really impressed with Kirby's design of Spider-Man. And while I would give anything to see what his initial sketch of Spider-Man was, the story goes that his version was too heroic for Stan's tastes. So the project was passed along to Steve Ditko, who gave us the iconic red and blue beauty known across the world. This collaboration with Ditko extended beyond the initial character design with the artist drawing the wall crawler's debut story along with the first few years of Spider-Man comics. But when you think about it, 
Ditko was an unusual choice to work on Spider-Man, because during that time, Steve Ditko was known for his richly atmospheric work on horror and suspense comics, especially at Charlton Comics with Tales of the Mysterious Traveler, and not to mention, nearly every single suspense anthology at Marvel Comics. As Benton writes, quote, Ditko created a world of dark shadows, lit with moonlight from nowhere, and filled with people whose faces had been tortuously elongated and then filled with sweat. Ditko's abnormal characters clawed their way through stories filled with spider webs, registering fear, shock, and surprise, and even the barest hint of horror. His stories were scary, regardless of what he drew." End quote. And if you've ever read through Spider-Man's early adventures, you might agree with that statement. Ditko drew Spidey in creepily contorted poses with a slender, elongated frame that differed from Marvel's other broad, muscular heroes. Spider-Man hunting down Uncle Ben's killer is depicted as genuinely terrifying, which has been emphasized in later recolorings of the tale. Uh, just look at how he looms over his enemy, clinging to a wall. Everything worked, and visually, the Very story was great. character, too. Because the way Steve would have him crawling on walls and swinging on webs, mm -hmm. and it just, everything came together. Perfectly. Which brings up another point. Spidey's ability to scale buildings might seem neat, or heck, you might not even make note of it at all a lot of the time, but it was the inspiration for the creation of Spider-Man, according to Stan Lee. I was sitting and I saw a fly crawling on the wall, and I said, wow, suppose a person had the power to stick to a wall like an insect. And that's a little odd when you think about it, because a person skittering across a wall or ceiling is so innately unsettling that countless supernatural horror films use this trope to intentionally provoke horror. And that's not just me saying this, you can actually witness it all the way back in Spider-Man's first issue. Just one panel after Peter learns of this new power, a young boy witnesses the spectacle and informs his mom of a man walking on the side of a building, to which his mom replies, quote, that's the last horror movie I take you to, young man. End quote. Yeah, even the characters in the comics themselves knew that the notion of a person crawling on walls is inherently scary. And that's not nothing. The horror genre is built around character response just like this to inform us, as the audience, on how to feel. And that is actually a pretty unique thing about the horror genre. As author Noel Carroll points out in his seminal work, The Philosophy of Horror, our responses are meant ideally to parallel those of the characters in the story, which is not always the case for other genres. I mean, think about it, right? In a comedy, someone might get hurt, but it's played for laughs. The character probably doesn't find it funny, but we, as the audience, are not meant to feel bad for him. But, as Carroll writes, quote, with horror, the situation is different. For in horror, the emotions of the character and those in the audience are synchronized in certain pertinent respects." End quote. In other words, you're scared, the characters are scared, everybody's scared. So when the first reaction to Spider-Man's wall-crawling power is a character effectively calling it horrific, that's meant to tell us as the readers that we should interpret it similarly. A human being skittering across the wall is creepy. But, and I warn you, this will sound very pretentious, why? I mean, look, clearly all of us know when something scares us, but what actually makes that thing scary. And how does Spider-Man qualify? Continuing in the philosophy of horror, Carol attempts to break down precisely what it is that makes something horrific. As you would imagine, the subject is a little complex, but to put it simply, objects of horror tend to be things that we deem impure. And sure, while that can mean things that are dirty or slimy, what impure really means in the context of horror monsters is more about our inability to categorize what it is that we're looking at. Some creatures are contradictory, like ghosts and zombies being both alive and dead. Zombies are also incomplete, rotting away and often missing entire limbs. Some spooky beasts are formless, like shapeshifters or other unseen threats that cling to the shadows. And then there are interstitial monsters that mix what would ordinarily be distinct and separate sources to form one single identity, like Frankenstein's monster, constructed from different parts of humans and animals to create one iconic monstrosity. Or a werewolf, being both man and wolf. I used to own this town. The basic idea is that these horror creatures don't fit neatly into a preconceived idea box that the rest of the world might have. They're uncategorical. They threaten common knowledge and expose holes in our understanding of the world. Like, imagine that you see a human kid who can do whatever a spider can. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, any size, catches seeds, just like guys. Look out, here comes a Spider-Man. Yeah, that doesn't really fit my understanding of reality, but obviously the difference between a Spider-Man and say a Wolf-Man is that Peter Parker wasn't outwardly changed into a monster. I mean, occasionally some stories will play up that gimmick, but his origin didn't showcase any physical deformities of his transformation. Spider-Man didn't look like a spider. Man 
So how could that story be scary, right? In horror tales, the monsters are frequently physically terrifying in some capacity. Maybe there's massive beasts, or perhaps swarms of unyielding threats, or maybe they're gross hybrid Cronenberg creatures. But Carol suggests there's another monster category that isn't tied to a creature's biology. Horrific metonymy. This describes a type of horror antagonist whose spookiness isn't something that can be outwardly perceived by looking at the monster. Think of uh, serial killers or other slasher flick antagonists who may look like ordinary humans to the naked eye, but are scary because they associate themselves with horrifying, disgusting things like murder, cannibalism, uh, torture, vermin, etc. As Carol writes, quote, frequently in such cases, the horrific being is surrounded by objects that we antecedently take to be objects of disgust and or phobia, end quote. And we've been kind of dancing around it for this entire video, but Spider-Man does have a motif that's built around two things that are often perceived as objects of fear and disgust, spiders and radiation. How are we doing? I don't know. Obviously, arachnophobia is one of the most common fears amongst humans. In fact, one study found that a simple silhouette of a spider, much like the one found on Spider-Man's chest, is iconic enough to grab our attention. Quote, spiders may be one of a very few evolutionarily persistent threats that are inherently specified for visual detection and uniquely prepared to capture attention and awareness. End quote. So, you know, probably wasn't much of a leap from there to include spiders in a few horror movies at the time, but a far more common trope was the use of radiation. Is he strong? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive blood. You see, during the years leading up to Spider-Man's creation, horror was a thriving genre in other media, especially movies, which often featured nuclear monsters like Godzilla. Heck, the highest grossing film of 1954 was about irradiated ants. Boy, that Ant-Man and Wasp trailer looks real strange, gang. Still gonna go see it. As you might imagine, the reason that atomic monsters were a constant threat in fiction is that the real world was dealing with the anxieties of different atomic monsters. Gamera. Sorry, nu uh, nuclear nukes. Also gamma, probably also gamma. Real threats brought real horrors to homes and schools, teaching kids that the white hot blast of nuclear annihilation could happen at any given moment. So make sure you get under that picnic blanket there, sport. It's really gonna help you out there, schlugger. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. As author Darren Hudson Hick wrote in an essay in Web Slinger about Spider-Man's connection to the horror genre, quote, for the first time, children understood horror, the horror that until now only soldiers had known. And this horror found an outlet in Hollywood, the terrors of an atomic Holocaust and nuclear mutation fueled the imagination of filmmakers and filmgoers alike." End quote. And if you're thinking, all of that happened in the 1950s, Spider-Man didn't debut until 1962. You're a dumb. So you're right, all of that did happen in the 1950s, and I am a dumb, but keep in mind what actually was happening in 1962. This is a special report from CBS News. Good evening, this is Walter Cronkite at CBS News headquarters in New York. This day looked as though it might be one of armed conflict between Soviet vessels and American warships on the sea lanes leading to Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Once again, Americans were in search of horror stories to provide a sort of cathartic release of pent-up atomic fears. Readers were hungry for it, but you remember how there was that code that prevented publishers from making horror comics? Yeah, that made it nearly impossible for comic books to tap into that market. The readers demanded horror comics, but, uh, the industry couldn't deliver anymore. To be fair, some comic books tried to relieve atomic fears in non-horror ways, and we talked before about how old Flash comics eased Cold War anxieties through stories of containment and science, and if you missed that video, maybe, uh, maybe subscribe so you don't miss other ones. The point is, American culture wanted horror stories that the comic book industry couldn't really deliver, thanks to the comics code. I mean, sure, Marvel had suspense comics, but they weren't really what people were looking for, especially when you compare them to the gruesome, terrifying tales the industry used to put out. And then, here comes this strange new superhero, named after a creature most people find scary, with abilities that allow him to inhumanly twist his body and skitter along walls, all drawn by an artist known for his inherently creepy art style. Kind of serendipitous, don't you think? And to be clear, I'm not at all saying the fact that Spider-Man happens to check all these boxes was by design. If Marvel wanted to intentionally create a genuine spider monster, 
they could have. Uh, there was nothing in the comics code that specifically forbade it. Although there was a clause that essentially said, just don't try to pull anything on us, guys, okay? Besides, Marvel was all about pushing the limits of the code anyway. Oh, what, we can't do vampires or werewolves? Then fine, here's a were pterodactyl named Carl, because screw you, I'm Stan Lee. Not to mention that Marvel actually did produce a story with a giant radioactive spider monster in Journey into Mystery number 73, which was published almost exactly a year before Spider-Man's debut. But when you add it all up, the spider and radiation motif, his uncategorical nature as both a spider and man, his creepy powers and Steve Ditko's unsettling artwork during an era where readers were hungry for horror comics that otherwise couldn't be produced, it starts to make sense why Spider-Man became a runaway success for Marvel. He filled a hole left by the comics code that shot the character's popularity into the stratosphere. Spider-Man was special and everyone could see it, even if they couldn't put their finger on why. As Stan Lee wrote at the top of Spidey's origin, costumed heroes are a dime a dozen, but we think you may find our Spider-Man just a bit different. And that was accidental. I mean, I don't, right. I don't think we planned it that way, but right. it was very fortuitous. But I want to know what you think. Was Spider-Man's popularity due at least in part to him accidentally, or perhaps even intentionally, resembling a horror character? And if that question wasn't confusing enough, here's an easier one. What's your favorite horror comic? Because I haven't read a lot of them, and I'm interested, and I gotta prepare for October already, even though it's only February. I'd love to know what you're thinking down in the comments below. I'll respond to some of them in the next comment response video. If you like this analysis of Spider-Man, then you are in luck, because we make videos like this about comic books, superheroes, and other nerdy stuff every single week. So for the third time in this video, please hit that big sexy subscribe button. It means a lot to me, and I also wanna make sure that you never miss an upload that we do. And if you really want, you can tap the bell icon to join the notification squad so you and I can check in the comments as soon as a new video goes live. It's my favorite part of the job. I also rarely ever promote this, but you can find NerdSync on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those places. You know how the internet works. You get it. As always, I want to thank our patrons who keep this show going, especially Christopher Lang, Keaton Lampert, Elizabeth Monsell, Everett Parrott, and the rest of the wonderful nerds over at patreon.com slash NerdSync. Click the tab right here to see my ancient video about the Comics Code Authority and comic book censorship. I guarantee it has not aged well. Alternatively, right down here is a video YouTube's mysterious algorithm thinks you specifically will enjoy. So if you don't like it, that's not on me. Thank you for watching, you wonderful nerds. My name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya.